Hi everyone, I'm back and welcome to another conspiracy video. Today, I promised this would be part two of the conspiracy theory about Kirk Bain surrounding his suicide or murder, depends which way you look at it. I felt like part one, just doing the one video, wasn't enough time to kind of give you all the facts, all the weird shit. I felt like it was a good idea for me to do a part two video and hopefully things don't get too confusing. Where possible, we'll pop pictures up like we did last time. So it's gonna be back to normal this week. I'm gonna be doing my makeup on camera whilst talking to you about the conspiracy theory, everything weird surrounding it. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. If you got through last week's video, thank you very much. I appreciate it, it was really long, but this isn't a simple conspiracy and there's a lot to it. So strap in, it's gonna be a long one. Hi, before you get stuck in today's video, this is Future Zoe here and I'd like to give you a couple of trigger warnings before you go any further. Your trigger warnings are going to be mentions of death, suicide, crime scenes in some detail, drug and alcohol abuse. Those are your warnings and I'll see you soon. Enjoy the video. So between now and recording last the last video, so part one, um, I've been I've reread the book Love and Death by Ian Halperin and Max Wallace. And there were a number of different things that I forgot about. Um, so I want to include them in today's video. It's just a couple of things. Well, I say a couple. There's quite a lot of things that were really off to do with the whole case and just really make it hard to believe that this was completely ruled out like cut and shut as a suicide. And we're going to be going into more detail about the people that were involved in this story, particularly people that were involved that were in um, Courtney Love's entourage. So it's a lot. Again, I'm not too sure how long this is going to end up being, but I'll do my best to keep it of a decent time for you. Like I said, it's really not simple and there's a lot to it. And also, in case you haven't guessed, I'm quite passionate about this one. I'm really passionate about it and it affects me on quite a deep level. Like I do almost lose sleep thinking about this. I know it sounds really dramatic and crazy, but if you understand it, you understand it. So since rereading the book, there's been a number of things that have popped up that I, I forgot about. So the, the first one I wanted to talk about was the fact that last time I said during the weird circumstances and evidence, there were no prints on the gun, okay? So the gun had been wiped clean. But since reading Love and Death, I realised that, well, I learnt that there were no prints found in the room at all. So there may have been prints on a few things, but the objects that were around Kurt, so the pen that he would have supposedly stabbed through the middle of his suicide note inside the little um, planter inside the greenhouse, no prints on it. Um, the, cig the cigar box next to him and various other objects, um, drug paraphernalia, no prints. I, 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 can't, I can't wrap my head around it. What was he supposed to have um, wiped all his own prints first before committing suicide? Like, I'm not buying it. I'm really not buying it. The other weird thing about the gun was that it was a 20 gauge light load shotgun. But before the shot that killed him was fired, it was loaded up with three shells. So the shell that ended up killing Kurt and there were two other shells loaded into the barrel of the gun. Now, I can understand if it was maybe like a, a handgun, like a five, six cylinder handgun. So you can put five rounds of ammunition or five bullets six bullets I think it's six six bullets into there and you know it was always like that you carried it around like that or you had it in your house like that but to to preemptively load a shotgun like no one I, it's weird it's weird I don't know a lot about firearms um but I like I said if it was a small handgun and the cylinder was already loaded and that's how he always kept it I'd understand but to preload a shotgun with three shells like pfft, it's just odd and I'm obviously not the only person who thought it was odd or I wouldn't be talking about this so one of the other strange things as well it's not strange it's just a fact that may shock you slightly it definitely shocked me when I learned of it so the Seattle Police Department and the chief command I think his name is Don Sergeant Donald Cameron if we've got a photo we'll put it here Sergeant Donald Cameron said that under no circumstances would the case be reopened and him and his team were competent. You know, they'd had between them a combined amount of several years of experience within homicide and um, finding bodies, you know, crime scenes, all of that. So under no circumstances would the case be reopened unless significant evidence came to light 
and it would be something that they would look at but until then it just wasn't going to get reopened so one of the authors of the book love and death had managed to obtain some pretty shocking evidence and they took it up to the um up to the police they took it to the building and they'd arranged to speak to donald cameron or they they were trying to speak to him and the receptionist said that he wasn't in and that he was out and he wouldn't be available to speak to because he was away at that point in time so these guys are like okay fine no worries like let us know when he's back or we'll just sit and wait for him it's really not a problem but he needs to see this and again you know more excuses are made no 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 it's fine you go because he's not going to be back for some time possibly might not even be back today so okay you know they're waiting or whatever or they're they're deciding whether they're going to leave and this is part of Nick Broom. So if you watch Nick Broomfield's documentary, which I've actually tried to find, it's not available anywhere. It literally, I think it was a year and a half ago, it was available to watch on Netflix. It's been removed. Now, I know Netflix have a bit of a jumble around and they do take old stuff out of their system. You know, they will remove things that perhaps haven't been watched much or or whatever. And I know that they have since removed programs, films and stuff like that. But I also tried to look on Amazon, I tried to look online, and the only place that I could find it, that I could watch it, was on Daily Motion. So for a documentary that was previously available, for it to be really, really hard to kind of track down and watch is a bit strange. Um, I don't know why that is, but we're going to get onto that a little bit more later on. These guys that were trying to speak to Don, they go to leave, and you can, like I said, on this documentary, you can actually see Donald Cameron peeking out from behind a like a divider wall in his office to see if these people have left. He didn't want to hear what they had to say, regardless of what it was. The information that these two had to hand over was the fact that they had a polygraph from a man who claimed that he was offered fifty thousand dollars to kill Kurt Cobain. It's unknown as to who may have asked him to do this, like hired him to, to do the kill, but he was offered $50,000 to do it. And when he was asked if this information was true, you know, is this legit? He passed. Yeah. So I don't know if Donald Cameron, I mean, he no longer works for Seattle Police Department, probably just as well. I'm not sure if he ever came to learn that information, but I mean, if he did, what would he think of that? Like, you can't, nobody can turn around and go, yeah, well, with that being said, we still think it's a suicide. Are you kidding me? Along with everything else that had been discovered, all the other work that Tom Grant had managed to dig up, like, you're you're seriously, you're seriously going to still stick with the story and, and the narrative that he absolutely killed himself? No. The other thing I want to mention, and this is something I literally read last night, is when these two guys were speaking to Tom Grant, so he gave them information, you know, he chatted about the case, but there were certain things that he wasn't willing to talk about. There were certain things that he wasn't willing to say and give information on. Um, and he said that he did have other information that he would talk about, but he's saving it, you know. If this case was to go back through the courts again and it was going to be reinvestigated and reopened, then he's got mo even more information, the information that we know about, which, I mean... Fuck me, there's so much as it is. What else have you got? Like, what else is there? I want to know. I really want to know. And I think it's part of the reasons, not only because of the morality, the, mo the morality, it's not only because of the morality of it that I want to see it reopened and reinvestigated, but I, I want to know what that information is. Like, I really do. So now we're going to start talking about the people of interest and some of the people that were involved in Kurt and Courtney's um, inner circle, but probably it's probably more appropriate to say people that were part of Courtney Love's entourage during this, I mean, before then, during this, and possibly after. So the first person of interest that we're going to talk about, not necessarily person of interest is in responsible for what happened, but there were weird goings on and it wasn't really fully addressed. It was just things that were noted by Tom Grant. The first person we're going to talk about is Eric Erlinson. Now, Eric Erlinson is a member of Hole, which is his and he Courtney Love's band. So Hole is Courtney Love's band. But he's also a ex-partner of Courtney Love. Even though they obviously were no longer together, he was still very much part of her inner circle, her entourage, and 
I don't know, it's probably quite unfair to say, but possibly true, so I'll say it anyway. Very much a assistant slash PA slash slave, however you want to look at it. After the meeting on the... So it was Sunday the 3rd of April, which was Easter Sunday. This was when Tom and Courtney first met, and Eric Erlinson was at the Ho- uh, Peninsula Hotel when this meeting happened. So there was the introduction, and she said that she was trying to... Um, she wanted to track down her husband, and somebody was using his credit cards. After this meeting, um, Eric Erlinson travelled to Seattle to try and find Kurt. Now, that doesn't sound strange at all. You know, it's completely reasonable. He's he's a good friend of Courtney's. He would have probably done a lot of things for her to try and help her and try and find Kurt. The weird part is Tom Grant, the man that was hired to find Kurt Cobain, didn't get told about it. It was never mentioned. And he found out at a later point that Eric had basically gone gone and got a flight, went to Seattle and tried to find Kurt Cobain. So we're going to talk about Jessica Hopper soon but it links to Eric. So Jessica Hopper was Callie DeWitt's girlfriend. And she was at the Lake Washington pro- property in Seattle when Eric Erlinson got there. And from her accounts, she says that he was very frantic and he was asking her, you know, have you seen him? Where is he? Has he got a shotgun with him? Do you know where the shotgun is? Very erratic and very all over the place. This, this was what she said about him. So Eric arrived back in LA at the Peninsula Hotel after, by Tuesday, the following week. He said he had an interview scheduled already, so this was part of what he, I'm assuming, told Tom at a later point. He told Tom that he or he actually had an interview scheduled, but he had to cancel it. Now, the strange part is that the person that was supposed to be having the interview with Eric said that they already had notes on the interview as if it had already gone ahead and basically what Eric said about having to cancel it, things had come up and he wasn't there, was actually in fact a lie. I don't know if you remember me talking about Courtney Love's staged arrest, but I'm going to mention it. We might, we're might going to go into a bit more detail with that later on, but the staged arrest that she had, um, Eric Erlinson was present for that as well. The fact that Eric had gone for his little search, he'd taken the time to travel up to Seattle to try and find Kurt, was especially odd, as it wasn't really brought up into conversation when Tom had offered to travel to Seattle, and this is when he carried out his search with Kurt's best friend, Dylan Carson. Um, Courtney didn't sort of say, oh, you know, Eric's already been up there, or would you like Eric to come with you? He's already been, but would you like him to come with you to, to widen the search? You know, more people, the more people, the better. It was never a conversation that went ahead. And Tom had said that he it strikes him as really odd as, as the man who she's paying to help find her husband, that she claims to be as so suicidal and she's so worried about, why on earth wouldn't he why wouldn't why on earth wouldn't she divulge information like that and and tell him it just does not make any sense none of this makes any sense but there you go despite the fact that eric erlinson had traveled up to go and find kurt and he'd been in been in seattle during the sort of time frame that everything was sort of going down during that week he was never actually interviewed by the police the next person that we're going to talk about is jessica hopper Jessica Hopper was Michael Callie DeWitt's girlfriend and at the time she was quite young I think she was only 16 or 17 years old and she'd been staying with Callie at the Lake Washington house in Seattle when she was spoken to that so basically she was interviewed by a guy called Everett True um, and she had said a couple of things about her stay there that were a little bit off and a little bit weird so she the reason she was hanging around is she was very much i think she met courtney first if i'm right and then she became to be um callie's girlfriend but she very much idolized courtney she looked up to her and she really wanted you know her to help her get her rock star career going and be part of what was called the riot girl movement the conversation that happened between kurt cobain which this is something to point out as well, okay? So Jessica Hopper and Michael Callie DeWitt are supposedly the la- one of the two of the last people that Kurt Cobain saw whilst he was still alive. And they were the last people to see him alive. And there was a conversation that happened between the three of them. I think it was in the morning. So Kurt travelled back to Seattle and he basically went into their room in the early hours of the morning and sat on the end of the bed. 
he talked to them and he addressed Jessica Hopper. Um, I believe the quote he used was, hey, skinhead girl, because I don't know, have a shaved head. And they had a little conversation. I'm not too sure if um, Callie had got irate with Kurt about the fact that Courtney was looking for him and, you know, he'd, he'd gone missing and nobody really knew what was going on. So this conversation, this sighting of Kurt, it was one of the last sightings of Kurt before he died. There are other people who saw him since then, but we're going to talk about them later. You would have thought that, you know, Callie had been in contact with Courtney a lot over the up and coming days. They'd had several phone calls on her phone records from the Peninsula Hotel. There were several outbound calls to Callie and they'd had conversations for uh, several times a day. You would have thought at some point during these phone calls that Callie would have divulged this information to Courtney. And I don't, I don't, this is the thing. I don't think for one second, I don't doubt that he didn't. It's the fact that the PI, again, I'm going to keep going on about it, had been hired to find Kurt. But the PI was never told about the fact that Kurt had been seen at the Lake Washington house. The other thing to note about Jessica is that she was interviewed by Everett True. And she told Everett True that on April the 4th, she saw Callie carrying a note upstairs. Um... I don't have any reason to believe that she lied, considering that Callie did actually, in fact, leave a note which was left for Kurt. Although, again, I think we'll we'll discuss that a bit more later. But the note, there was the note that he wrote out to Kurt. So it's not entirely unusual. He could have been looking for another place to, to place it, that he would hope that Kurt would find it. Um, so she mentions that, and it's it's just a bit strange. I do, I do even wonder, there is a part of me that wonders... It could have been part of the um, fabrication of the suicide note. Maybe it wasn't planned for Kurt to be found in the greenhouse. Maybe, maybe that I don't know. They were looking at different areas of the house that potentially they could arrange for Kurt's body to be found. But after reading what I've read, I'm still very much dead set on the fact that it was he was supposed to be in the greenhouse all along, and the fact that it, it appeared to be set up quite conveniently. We had the um, electrician guy. When he so he was the one he was scheduled to do work on the greenhouse and it had been phoned in. I I need to double check this. I will double check this. I think so. When he was scheduled to do the work on the side of the greenhouse and install a security light, I believe that the work the work was arranged literally the day before by Courtney herself and it was all booked in and he was due to turn up to do the work at nine o'clock. Jessica Hopper returned to Minneapolis. She flew back from Seattle to Minneapolis, and this was the Tuesday before Kurt's body was found. I mean, I knew I was going to do grunge, but fuck me, that looks hella grunge. We're going to talk about Dylan Carson now. So I mentioned in my previous video in part one that Dylan Carson is Kurt Cobain's best friend. Dylan Carson was the guy who went with Kurt to buy his shotgun, the shotgun that ended up taking his life. And this was the shotgun that was used to kill Kurt Cobain or Kurt Cobain chose to kill himself, whichever way that you want to look at it. They were really, really good friends. I'm not too sure how many years they were best friends for, but I know that they did used to sit and shoot heroin um, together. The other thing that's strange is that during a conversation with Tom Grant, Courtney Love herself speculated she thought that it's possible that Dylan had seen Kurt's body through the doors of the greenhouse and it was why he'd been acting a little bit strange he didn't really appear according to tom he didn't appear to show any emotion when he found out about the news that kurt cobain had died he was just completely almost blank faced and when tom said to him where's the greenhouse why 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 didn't we go there and dylan had said oh it's just a dirty little room above the greenhouse um above the garage sorry it was a dirty little room above the garage and i just think that they keep lumber there and Tom found that extremely strange. But Courtney had speculated that the reason, you know, Dylan was a bit odd about it all was that he'd already seen Kurt's body and it wasn't a shock. Now, from my perspective, I do wonder if he knew that Kurt was going to be killed and perhaps that's why he wasn't phased by it. I like to think not. Like, I like to think that they were, you know, they were good friends and everything and that Dylan wouldn't, Dylan wouldn't have allowed that to happen to Kurt. But you just don't know. It just seems in this entire story, we're not really able to trust anyone. The other weird fact about that as well and the reason why Tom Grant doesn't necessarily disagree with Courtney Love's speculation is the fact that on the night of the search 
when Dylan said he was going to go up and check the house first because that way if Kurt was there he didn't want to alarm him and like give him a chance to flee if he realised that Dylan had come up and travelled with a private investigator that had been hired by Courtney he took a good five minutes to come back to the car before he said that anybody was home and Tom just felt like this was too strange or it was too long of a time length a period of time to come back and say no one's in so this is a complete speculation of Tom Grant's and it doesn't necessarily form from fact. I mean, the fact is that only weeks after Kurt had died, um, Dylan effectively started working for Courtney Love and he would place phone calls to Tom Grant's office on her behalf. Um, the speculation part comes from Tom and it comes in here that the reason he thought that this was going on is because now that Kurt had died... Um, Dylan no longer kind of had financing for his incredibly severe heroin habit so he wondered if working for Courtney and kind of doing her bidding and things like that was a payoff or like a um, like a deal for his drugs and this is kind of confirmed kind of confirmed I mean again it can only it can't be proven but it's kind of confirmed when Tom says that he needs to go around the house and speak to Dylan and ask him a couple of questions and tries to arrange this with Courtney. And Courtney says, yeah, like, that's fine, no problem. Well, I can't imagine she said it as nicely as that, as that. But she said, yeah, sure. And then on the day that he was supposed to go around and speak to Dylan, um, Dylan was upstairs and he came down after being sat upstairs with Courtney and he was completely out of it. He'd basically gone up and shot up heroin and came downstairs completely out of it. He couldn't string together a proper sentence and there was just no way a proper conversation could have happened between him and Tom and Tom was just fed up, you know. It just seemed really off that he'd said, you know, I do need to speak to Dylan. Courtney knew about this, but then him and her had been upstairs shooting up heroin together right before Tom was supposed to speak to him. No words. Nick Broomfield actually interviewed Dylan Carson for his documentary and in his own words he said that Dylan came across very um, evasive and when they talk when he asked him about Kurt's death and they were talking about it he didn't seem upset like you would kind of expect but instead he just he seemed more fearful about it which is a bit off you've got to admit it's a bit off there was one thing that was mentioned in the love and death book that I'm currently reading and out of everybody within the entire situation Dylan, won't, Dylan was the only person within the entire group of people that we spoke about that was actually staying in Seattle during the time that the, all the events went down and that Kurt had, had died and when he was found dead. He was the only person out of everybody that was still staying in Seattle. One of the points that both Tom and the uh, Ian Halperin and Max Wallace have made, and it's a very valid point as well, that... Courtney, after after this Rome incident, and I'll explain the Rome incident shortly, but after the Rome incident that went ahead, Courtney insisted to anybody would listen, to, uh, whether it was to Tom or whether it was to the Associated Press or any of the news outlets, anybody at all, that Kurt was always had been suicidal. I mean, she even said this after. She'd come out and give interviews and, and talk to the press and say, you know, oh, he was always suicidal. Um, he was always suicidal you know the Rome incident that was suicide it was just never portrayed to the news that it was suicide you know it had been painted that it had been said and reported that it was a complete accident and it had never meant to happen um, but it's very questionable the fact that if this was the case Courtney knew this you know and she if if this was if this was a known, a known fact right let me just put it to you Who's going to know Kurt better than anybody apart from maybe, say, Courtney Love? Who? He's either his bandmates or his best friend. If it was a known fact that Kurt was suicidal, everybody knew it. It was everywhere to see. He was always talking about how he was going to get a gun and shoot himself. If this is the case, why would his best friend go with him, go and help him buy a shotgun? The other thing that's strange and that I wanted to add to that is Dylan said to Tom and he said to other people that he didn't believe that Kurt was suicidal. The other person that we're going to talk about is Renee Navarrete. Now, he was part of... So he was basically hired by Courtney to be a nanny for their daughter, Frances Bean Cobain. So now he works as a film director. At the time, 
it been, it's been noted that Courtney had basically said to Renee at some point, oh, if, if his name's Reen, I apologise, but I'm just going to... Reen? Reen Navarrete? Yeah, okay, we'll call him Reen. He's called Reen now. She'd said to Reen um, that it was his job to shadow Kurt as much as possible and basically always be in his footsteps and spend as much time with him as possible. I do find this strange. Like, I do find it a bit odd. Like, I, I don't really know what the purpose of that would be. I don't know if it's to do with something, like, music-related. Um, maybe, like, observing what Kurt was like and to, to learn from him. I don't know. I don't think he was interested in anything musically. Like, from what I could find, just from looking him up, it didn't seem to be that way at all. But it either way, I mean, if not, it just seems as a really odd thing for Courtney to say to him. He spent, he, and he did exactly that. He spent quite a bit of time with um, Kurt to the point that they would, you know, shoot heroin together and quite regularly. And, you know, in case it hasn't already dawned on you, it dawned on me pretty soon and it disgusted me. So he would shoot up heroin quite regularly with Kurt and in the house. This is also the same guy that Courtney Love hired to be a nanny of her child. Yeah. So this was, this is a quote here from Reen himself, and he said, Kurt himself told me a couple of times that if he was going to kill himself, that would be the way he'd do it, exactly that way. We joke about it, we joke about the process, doing such a big enough issue of dope that we could get the gun to our heads, and that was what happened. Kind of sounds like somebody saying that after the fact to make it more legitimate and more believable that that was what happened and how it happened, but I mean... I've got opinions, quite a lot of them. That's just mine. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments down below. Reen was another guy that was part of Courtney's entourage that backed up the statements that the Rome incident was a suicide attempt of Kurt's. And he basically commented on commented on the way that Kurt would take drugs and that was that was that made him suicidal was the way that he took drugs. This isn't something that I deem to be anything to do with any of the people. That This is just one of my opinions, okay? This is the thing that bothers me. Just because somebody somebody takes drugs, they're a drug addict, it doesn't mean that they commit suicide. Just because they have a gun led across their chest, believe it or not, doesn't mean he committed suicide. There are such... Th of course, I mean, if you're a true crime buff and you've watched any documentaries or any videos on instances of homicide, then you'll probably know that there is such thing as stage suicide. And... <sighs> There's the percentage of well as when there's homicide in the family home, how often the statistics of the suspects and how often it is the spouse of that of that person. And yeah, it just bothers me. I, I in my opinion, I do wonder if these if this police department just looked at him. Maybe they thought the paperwork would be too much. Maybe they thought it would just take too long to get to the bottom of it. You know, and even if they did get to the bottom of it, how lawyered up the person the the offence would be. And I just think the other part of me just thinks they looked at the body on the floor and they just assumed heroin addict must be a suicide. And it's really not the case. And it's, you know, we talked about the amount of drugs in his system last week as well. And that's another thing to note too, is that um, doing a bit of reading, there was a lady, um, she, she specialised in looking at toxicology. So she wasn't a forensic examiner, but it was in her line of work. And it's not as simple as say me, okay? I can take three times the lethal dose of heroin. You could be four stone lighter than me and you could also take three times the lethal dose of heroin. But based on our weight and our heights and various factors like that would, base, would, would basically determine what would be three times your lethal dose. There is also a debate that was sparked up about P um, junkies, like tolerances towards heroin. I'm going to say addicts, like heroin addicts. I feel like junkies is a really offensive term. I would just don't really feel like it's appropriate. But there is a lot of debate that was sparked about the tolerance and there were a lot of arguments to do with this. I believe... I don't, I can't, I can't check this because I can't find the documentary, but I believe in Nick Broomfield's BBC documentary, Kurt and Courtney, um, they actually, they did an experiment or they filmed an experiment to do with this guy and he took supposedly the same amount of drugs um, that Kurt would have had, um, that Kurt had in his system, sorry, 
and he was apparently he was able to hop on one leg and he was able to do various other activities and somebody pointed out i'm not too too sure who it was that pointed this out but they said that he had taken methadone which is a drug used to help people get off of heroin but it's also administered orally so it doesn't go straight into the bloodstream and it doesn't act as quickly as say a shot of heroin would so it made it completely inaccurate it wasn't heroin that they took and they took it orally which means it takes longer to ingest and get into the bloodstream completely pushing the entire theory out of the water that somebody could function on those amount of drugs it just it didn't make sense it didn't add up it didn't work it would be like me um cutting open a pear and cutting open an apple and expecting the chemicals or the values of each thing inside to be the same they're not going to be or apples and oranges we should say i'll say no more going back to reen um, Courtney Love placed several calls to Reen from the Peninsula t- Hotel and this was after Kurt had left the Exodus Recovery Centre so I'm not too sure what they were talking about I don't know that's assuming that Courtney knew that he was leaving the Exodus Recovery Centre but all these people this is why we're talking about them apart from maybe Jessica all these people at some point would have had a phone call from Courtney Love and quite a few phone calls during the day literally days before and days after Kurt had died or the day that Kurt had died and it is it's just I don't know it's weird so this is the bit that got me scratching my head and I was a bit um I didn't really know how to feel when I read this in the past Courtney Love had once plotted that she would have Reen fly to New York City and he was supposed to break into Lynn Hirschberg's apartment and kill her dog and she would basically pay him $5,000 to do this job. Lynn Hirschberg, if you don't know about her, read her up. Just going off my memory here, I believe she wrote an article about Courtney Love but it wasn't as flattering as Courtney perhaps would have liked. In fact, I don't think it was flattering at all. I think she just spoke about um, Courtney's um, drug addiction and yeah she i think she's had it out for lynn ever since but yeah she was she was genuine this was a genuine thing she was going to pay reen five thousand pounds so that he would basically go break into lynn hirschberg's apartment and kill her dog the next person we're going to talk about is michael kelly dewitt now this is another person that courtney knew previously and she was actually an ex-lover of she asked kelly to move back to la when Kurt and Courtney used to live in LA to be another hired nanny for Francis. Another hired nanny for Francis, who is a heroin addict. Callie was another person who Courtney repeatedly contacted and spoke to several times a day before Kurt's body was found in the days leading up to it. And this was all on the, um, the phone records from the Hotel Peninsula. Callie's pretty much confirmed himself that he was part of, um, Courtney's inner circle and entourage and he also said in an interview with the guy um, Everett True that you don't choose Courtney she chooses you. As well as being in the epicentre of Courtney Love's entourage he was also in possession of a credit card which had a limit of $50,000 and it was believed to be the source of funding for his heroin habit. In part one that I uploaded last week we, I told you about the note that Callie left on the stairs for Kurt. Now, when you consider the fact that the story that Courtney was hospitalised and it was completely phony and false, it just makes the letter even more phony itself. So in this letter, Callie is basically guilt tripping Kurt and he's saying, look, she's in the hospital, dude, like she's going to die. Like, this isn't okay. Get your shit together. Speak to her. Talk to her. She's worried about you. All of this. When you consider the fact that that wasn't even true, it didn't even happen, it just makes this letter just sound like a... I'm just going to say it. It sounds like a complete and utter piece of bullshit. And particularly as Callie and Courtney were exchanging phone calls quite a lot, um, all at this time, while she was at the Peninsula Hotel, Callie would have, you'd assume, have been up to date with everything going on. And... I think it's safe to say that he knew that she wasn't in the hospital, but he put it in the letter anyway. Kind of sounds like the two were pairing up. And it's also the fact that Callie used to be an ex-lover of Courtney's. I don't know whether he he was trapped or she very much had him in her inner circle. So whether he kind of teamed up with her fully knowing what was going on, whether she kind of manipulated him and used him as like a bit of a tool with the entire situation. Just, just speculate. That's my speculation. 
to Steve Kirkland of the Seattle Police Department. When he was shown the note, he turned around and stated, I don't care if Callie writes a note or Courtney writes a note. That has nothing to do with our investigation. I think a piece of evidence that's kind of relevant to the situation and his whereabouts and the entire the entire debacle, whatever you want to call it, to say that something like that is completely irrelevant, it's not, it's not part of it, it, it just, it blows my mind. Like I said in my previous video, I feel like if this was anybody else, it'd be something that's looked into, and I don't know if they just judged the situation purely on the fact that Kurt was a known heroin user and a heroin addict, it just doesn't, I just don't understand You've got all of that in front of you, you know. It's not as if Tom was holding back these pieces of information. He was trying to give these pieces of information to the police department, to Sergeant Donald Cameron, and say, look, there's something a bit off. I'm, I'm not jumping to conclusions, and I'm not saying this is necessarily the case, but I feel like it's important to look for you to look at it. And at every possible opportunity, he didn't take any of his opportunities. He didn't take it seriously, and he described... Um, I think he, it was him that said it. I'm not too sure if it was um, Cameron that said this about Grant, but the comment was made that Tom was basically just a conspiracy theorist. Now, let me just say, bearing in mind that before Tom Grant was a private investigator, he was a police officer and he worked specifically in and around homicide. So for a guy like this to pick up on things as he's going along, bearing in mind that when Courtney Love hired Tom and she spoke to him from the phone for the first time and he asked for her name and, oh, can I have your husband's name? Are, are you serious? Was what she said, like, are you, are you having a laugh? She said, we're kind of famous. He didn't actually know who Kurt Cobain was at that point in time. He didn't realise. So, yeah, I, I don't think he was a whack job conspiracy theorist. I just think he saw, I think he was very vigilant. I think he's very observant. And I think he saw all of these things along the way. And I believe that a police officer that doesn't want to be made to look stupid, he doesn't want to reopen a case that, you know, if all these things were glaring red flags, as Tom put it, and then the when investigating into it again, and they go, oh yeah, how do we overlook, how do we overlook this? It just makes a mockery of the police department. People lose their faith in them but surely for the sake of morality and for justice and for things being right and for people to know the truth particularly fans of Kurtz like there's one thing I haven't mentioned yet and it's something that's really it's really upsetting is that so there are a lot of copycats so, sorry <clears throat> There are a lot of copycat suicides after the time of Kurt's death and I'm not going to talk about their, I'm not going to mention names as much as their names have been made public and the way that they died. I think it's important to mention that these were fans who Kurt's music and Nirvana's music very much lighted, lit away for them. It gave them escapism. It gave them something to hold on to, some somebody to... You know, a lot of the lyrics, some of the lyrics were quite dark and moody, but it, it's, they felt like they could relate to it. it. It meant something to them, regardless of what anybody else thinks, it meant something to them. And these copycat suicides, there were a lot. And I think as much as there's a possibility, and I'm, I'm not going to say that, I know I've said I don't believe he committed suicide, but if there's even a small percentage that, you know, if he did commit suicide, even then it's bad that these people died, but let's just say that he didn't and all these people all these people took their own lives because they either wanted to join Kurt or they felt like they could because their hero had is so heartbreaking and I feel for the parents and the family and the friends of those people I really do and I feel for those people that they felt that they should take their own lives and I just think it's something to be noted is that you know regardless of what image it paints of the police department or the people of that time I mean bearing in mind they don't even this guy left the police that he was done I don't know how long after it was but he left and it was unfortunately the reason that he left was to do with a case where he was um believed to be assisting in the theft of money that was found at a person's property and the money got pocketed and he was in on it and I don't know if he took a cut but I know it took him quite a while to um talk about it and it, I think it's just the whole thing was shady it was basically corruption and 
you know, this guy, he's no longer got part to do with it. But the people that do work for Seattle, Seattle Police Department, if it's a case that only they can look into, or even, you know, let's just say they don't want to, get some other department from somewhere else to come in and look at it. Let the private investigators do the work. Take interviews, arrange polygraphs, try and take prints off of other things, of evidence that have been taken away if it hasn't already been destroyed. Develop those photographs. Have other people analyse the evidence that was photographed from the from the, the scene of the body where everything happened. Just, do you know what? <sighs> I can't get too upset. I went off on a tangent then, and I'm sorry, but the note that was placed on the staircase in the house, this was between the hours of 11 p.m. on Thursday the 7th of April, and it was after Tom Grant and Dylan's initial search because they came back to the house, and that's when they found the note. So happening between 11 p.m. Thursday the 7th of April and 9 a.m. Friday the 8th of April, which was when Kurt's body was found, and it was found by the electrician. So at some point between the first timestamp and the second timestamp, after Tom and Dylan had initially gone to the house, somebody would have had to gone back to the house and place the note. And that actually goes against Callie DeWitt's testimony that he'd left of Monday that week and he didn't return. So bearing in mind Callie's testimony that he was barely at the house, which again, I think is a very vague testimony in itself. You either know if you were at the house or not, but in his own words, he was barely at the house since Monday that week. He flew back to LA the day before Kurt's body was discovered. So. I don't know whether he was somewhere else in Seattle. I'm not sure. I think there's a couple of reports that he said that he went to go stay at another girl's house or another friend's house in Seattle. But he he flew back the day before the body was discovered. Now, if he was so irritated at Kurt's disappearance and he was concerned enough to leave a note to guilt trip him to say, you're a fucking asshole. I, how, did I not, how did I not see you? And he spoke to him. Tom Grant, who... Callie quote unquote called the great private investigator why wouldn't you tell Tom Grant that you saw him and spoke to him with your girlfriend a few days before and why wouldn't you go and check the greenhouse you know the property you live there you spend a majority of the time there why wouldn't you go and check the greenhouse Next, we're going to talk about Pat Smear. Now, Pat Smear was a former founding member of the band The Germs, and he was a guitarist who joined Nirvana on Courtney Love's influence, and he later on, so after Kurt died, he became a member of the Foo Fighters back in the day. Courtney was completely responsible for Pat's involvement with Nirvana, and she takes credit for this herself, saying that um, he's not the best guitarist in the world, but I, it was really nice of me to involve him and encourage him, right? So Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic when um, consulted by Kurt in terms of a decision of bringing Pat Smear into the band. Um, and he was also present at Kurt's intervention, which happened, I believe it was March time, um, that Courtney Love had basically held for him. He's never cooperated with a single Cobain biographer, despite his affinity with Kurt and all of his involvement and his closeness to him. He was never, he just wouldn't, when he was asked to comment on it for a book, like a biography, he he wouldn't give any information. And I just think, you know, if you had no part to play in it, there's nothing dodgy about it. Why wouldn't you say something? Like if you if you were close to the guy and you liked him, why wouldn't you give any kind of a testimony? It just strikes me as a bit strange. Lots of things strike me as strange, spoiler alert. So Pat was also one of the last people to see Kurt Cobain alive. He visited, so this again, this is a bit strange. He visited Kurt at Exodus Recovery Rehab Centre on the 1st of April, and then he left at 6.30pm, which was just over an hour and a bit before Kurt left himself. Several calls were placed to Pat from Courtney after Pat left the recovery centre, and this is actually proven by the phone records from the Peninsula Hotel. Pat's made statements to the media and anybody that will listen to that Kurt Cobain called him and left a message on his answer machine before he died. Apparently he left a message saying that he needed help and Pat states that he didn't know what the help was that he needed. A bit odd, like a bit weird, like you saw the guy, you know, before he left the rehab centre, like, I don't know, it's just mm, weird. Apparently, even though this, this happened, um, there's been no like replay of the message, like it's never been released to the public and the police were never told about this. The call would have had to be placed between the hour between him leaving Exodus and Kurt leaving Exodus. Again, another thing that it would be very unusual not to tell Tom Grant about. Pat Smear, Callie DeWitt, 
Reen Navarrete and Eric Erlinson were all in Seattle just before or during the time that Kurt died, but all of them flew back to LA where Courtney Love was before his body was discovered. As well as Soaked in Bleach, there was another documentary made about Kurt's death and the suspicions of it by a guy named Nick Broomfield. It was called Kurt and Courtney and aired in 1998. The documentary is referred to as a parody by some people, claiming it doesn't really go anywhere or make any particular kind of a point. The documentary was pulled from the Sundance Film Festival over legal threats regarding music rights, which Courtney Love has the rights to. There is no mention of the film being pulled due to information that is unsavoury of any of the people mentioned in it. I'm going to go and I'm going to talk about the Rome incident really briefly with you. You can read up about this if you like, but whether or not the story that you read will be accurate, I don't know, because Courtney has since given different accounts of what hap- what has happened, and she's changed her story on it a couple of times now. It's believed that so Kurt got ill. And he left one of the tours that he was on and travelled back to go and spend time with Courtney and Francis Bean. So he travelled to their hotel to go and see them and spend time with them. With them. It's during that time that I don't know if there was heroin involved, but I know that he'd been drinking a lot of champagne and he'd consumed rehypnol. I'll put a um, description of rehypnol and its effects and its effects up here if you don't know what they are. But rehypnol is used as like a sedative and it's also been it's now currently known as the date rape drug. But when mixed with alcohol, it can be really lethal. It's thought that Kurt had ingested quite a few tablets and this had caused him to basically collapse and go in like a coma like state. He was rushed to hospital and I think they pumped, I'm pretty sure they would have pumped his stomach then, but he got really, really poorly, really sick and it was quite a close call. It was all in the news, the media, everybody knew about it whilst it was going on. And even Dave Grohl since said like, you know, he was worried when he spoke to him after he came out of the hospital, he said, look, dude, like, I'm worried you're going to die. And Kurt had said, look, you know, I'm sorry, but it was an accident. Like, it is, it, don't worry, it's absolutely fine. Now, I believe that after Kurt had actually died, Courtney had then came out to the papers, press, anybody, media, news, and said that was a suicide attempt. This is backed up by other people, but these people, just remember, they're all in her little circle. They're all in what I keep referring to as her entourage, and nobody else seems to agree with that statement people close to Kurt that spoke to him about it don't really agree with that statement and the whole thing just seems like a bit of a farce there was another um episode before that where police were called to Kurt Kurt and Courtney's um property and Courtney had said that Kurt had locked himself into a bathroom and that he had a gun and he was threatening to shoot himself with it. But then she said that she was, there's another account that she says that she was in the room with him and she took the gun off him and said, if you, she took another gun and held it to her head and she said, if you do it, I'll blow my fucking head off too. It's really, really messy. But apparently the real story is that when the police turned up to the court, to obviously the, um, the 911 call, they took the gun from Kurt. Apparently, he was quite cooperative. He was he was enraged because obviously he'd had a fight with his wife, but he was quite calm and cooperative, cons- all things considering. Um, and yeah, it's just there doesn't seem to be a none of the stories all seem to match up particularly the stories that she gave about the entire scenario. But I think it's important to mention that. The impression that he was suicidal was really laid on thick by Courtney and a couple of other people, but the thickest of all, it was laid on by Courtney. Um, and the days leading up, you know, when you know when she first spoke to Tom Grant, she was saying, like, he's suicidal, he's got a gun. But then she was angry and going on about how much money she was going to lose him and she was going to make sure that she won if there was a divorce. And if he wants to leave me, that's fine. And she'd also got it into his head that Kurt was, Kurt was having an affair with another woman, a drug dealer. And when Tom said, like, do you want me to put surveillance on the house so that if he comes back, we can find him and we can catch him? And she was just like, she was more, she said no, she didn't want surveillance on the house, but she did want surveillance on a drug dealer by the name of Caitlin Moore that she believed Kurt to be having an affair with. So she'd gone from being really concerned that her husband was missing and someone was using his credit card. He was suicidal and he had bought a shotgun. Then she went to, I want you to find him. I think the scumbag's cheating on me with this woman. All in the same breath, all in the same day. I understand from an outsider's point of view, if you're not necess- if you're not a Nirvana fan or you've not really heard about this theory or you've not really seen me talk much on my channel about conspiracy theories yet, 
of course, you could pigeonhole me as a Nirvana fan and that I, because I'm a Nirvana fan and a Kirk Main fan, that I can't possibly just accept the fact that he did kill himself and that is that. I get that. I really do. And I'll be completely honest with you, before I read this book, before I heard about it, before I heard about the investigation, I wasn't aware that the work by the PI had been done by Tom Grant. I wasn't aware of this theory. I wasn't aware of the facts or the evidence. The only thing that I knew is that he'd shot himself in the head and that he died. I believed he committed suicide. But when I read the book and you scratch the surface a little bit deeper, not all is as it seems. And because it's not confirmed, we can call it a conspiracy theory. The reason that I believe it to be what it is and the reason that I have these feelings aren't based on the dodginess of someone's character. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't help the entire thing. The weirdness of the, the constant phone calls to various other people, the, the phoniness of the note, the handwriting, um, you know, the, the note, the suicide note, the handwriting, the... <sighs> The fact that Rosemary Carroll had found um, practice practice sheets of handwriting in Courtney Love's bag, it doesn't help. But the thing that really sways me over are the facts and the even the science of it, the toxicology, the fact that the gun would have been too long, you know, to, it would have been impossible for him to fire it himself. The fact that the shotgun shell didn't land where it should have if he'd have pulled the trigger in a particular kind of way. The fact that the entire crime scene was right down of fingerprints. I could go on, but I'm not going to. What I'm saying is, I don't believe in this conspiracy theory because I struggle to come to terms with the fact that he's dead. He died when I was one. I always believed that he committed suicide up until now so my reasons for feeling so strongly about this isn't because i'm a diehard nirvana fan that can't accept the fact that somebody that i look up to looked up to and idolized is dead there's what i read this and it was really fucked up and that is that courtney love actually worked with a company to have a doll of kurt made like a like a ken or a barbie the fucked up part of it was that after his death she was still making money on merchandise and I don't believe that it was merchandise for the fans to help them move on. I believe it was completely about her making more money and cashing in as much as possible. The doll was made, so the doll was wearing clothes that were basically replicas of the clothes that he was found when he was found dead. Since, as well as obviously the music rights, um, Courtney has made money continuously from music royalties and various merchandises that she's either, she'll have agreed to and signed off on. At one point, she even made Kurt Cobain lunch boxes. And if you Google, if you search for it, I'm not too sure how you'd find it or how I found it. There is a painting of her and she is painted, she's depicted as like this angel like figure, long flowy blonde hair, big aura around her head. And she's got what looks like the body of Jesus Christ over her lap. You look a little bit closer, looks like Kirk Cobain dead across her lap. I know some people's heads are a bit fucked up and I know some people's idea of what art is and the, um, the subject is behind it, the message that it's trying to, to send, like the undertones of a painting or a piece of artwork. Trust me, I know better than a lot of people, I am an artist by trade, but it's just too messed up for me. Glorify your husband in a way where he's not painted as a dead corpse across your lap whilst you have this big angelic glow around your head. So Courtney had a criminal background of violent behaviour. Her ex-lover James Morland, she actually set fire to his bed whilst he was still in it. And luckily, in his words, he said he got out okay because he woke up and realised that the bed was on fire and got away in just a plenty of amount of time. She's also physically hurt people in the past, so it's been completely unprovoked. And I feel like I said that in part one, but I'm just reiterating that she's no stranger to violence and hurting other people and basically doing what she needs to get what she wants. You know, she crawled her way up as kind of like a groupie around the punk rock scene and ended up where she was because of that. She met her at a gig and they, they clicked and they gelled well and they spent time together. But people had found notes in her backpacks and previous writings of get rich, marry rock star, become rock star, get money. This, this was her motive. And I believe she was pretty open about it, if I'm honest. She banged on quite a lot about all the money that he lost her and how much that fucked her over, not the fact that her husband had died. She, even when at, um, 
at his funeral she read out um, parts of the suicide note and she said well you should have just stopped you fucking asshole like she repeatedly called him a fucking asshole i get that some people are angry when they're grieving but i feel like as well as respect for your dead husband it should be the respect of the other people that are in the room that loved him as well and uh, pick your words pick your audience read a room I can understand that some people would just view this as who she is, it's her personality, but that doesn't necessarily make it any less strange, not when you add up all these kind of individual events, and particularly the events obviously with the scenario around Kurt's death, the timestamps, the things that she said on the voice recordings, the fact that the things that upset her and that were her priority completely flip-flopped, she contradicted herself, she planted fake stories in the news, I personally believe that she wanted to get herself hospitalised and there was like a fake arrest as well. She got arrested. Well, it wasn't a fake arrest. She did get arrested. But the heroin that was found on her was proven to be Hindu good luck ashes. She also had what was a stolen um, doctor's prescription notepad. But she stated it was simply a prescription notepad that was left over from when her doctor was there and they forgot it. There just seemed to be an excuse for everything. But I do believe that the arrest and the hospitalisation was purely so that she had like an alibi for where she was at the time that Kurt would have killed himself. I don't know, it just seems like a bit of a fix, do you know what I mean? If you got arrested but everything, there was an excuse for every single little thing. I also don't get that if you hire a PI to look for your missing husband, why there'd be information that you would hold back. I don't understand why you wouldn't cooperate unless you had something to hide. I don't understand. I can understand sometimes when you're trying to explain something to somebody, you forget certain dates of things or the exact words that were said and particularly if it's something traumatic it's hard to recall everything which is why when witnesses are interviewed at a police station they'll give you ample time they'll be very patient with you can you know depending on the circumstances to get the information as accurate as possible particularly when it comes of descriptions of people and so on so forth so i just don't i can i can see that it's hard to recall everything but for her accounts and her stories to contradict themselves, you know, before his death and after his death and new information to surface to come to light and, you know, repetition is everything. If you say something over and over again, if I say to you, you know, you're tired, you're tired right now watching this video, you are tired. Rem don't yawn, you're tired. If I keep saying that, even if you're not tired, eventually you're going to start to believe it. And it's not like a hypnosis thing, but repetition really is powerful and in the right in the right circumstance to repeatedly say to people or people people of importance you know the media they were they were going to help depict kurt as this hopeless soul who was so hopelessly suicidal the police who looked into it you know oh we found his body suicidal that's suicide and she tried it with private investigator tom grant but I don't believe he disbelieved her. I just think it was the things that he found and her behaviour and the words that she said that kind of struck up those red flags. During part one's video, I read out Kurt's suicide note. I've since reread it and he does mention Courtney and Francis in it before the last four lines. Um, it's very, very brief though. And like I said, for a loving father and a doting dad, like a loving, a loving father and a partner of somebody i just i feel like he would have he would have spoken about them more had it been a legit suicide note and there are many people that believe it was a farewell but not a farewell in terms of killing himself it, it was him explaining why he didn't want to be in the spotlight he didn't want to be this huge rock star that i don't think he even intended to become i mean dave grohl said himself that kurt didn't handle fame too well and that he, he didn't have a desire to be this massive rock star that he became. The whole theory with him shooting up the amount of heroin that he did, I'm just gonna say this. If he was in a dark place, I don't, but he had already preemptively decided he was going to kill himself. I don't doubt for one second that maybe taking a bit of heroin for like his final high before he died would be unreasonable. And if you're a bit like Dutch courage as well, I think if I was going to kill myself, like as much as if I wanted it, you'd still want a bit of Dutch courage or something just to push you over the edge to make you do it. You know, maybe you drink quite a lot that night or maybe you would take some form of a drug. I don't think that's an unlogical thing to happen. I just don't. I think he would have known from being a heroin user for quite a while, that shooting that much would just completely incapacitate him. 
and I don't I don't I just I can't see it I've said that before I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself but I just I think he would have taken a dosage of it I just don't think he would have shot up that much I think his relationship with the band took a bit of a nosedive since Courtney's involvement with it. She was quite pushy about a lot of things. She was angry about the amount of money and the rights that Chris Novoselic and Dave Grohl had. Um, and she didn't feel like it was right because they didn't write a single lyric of any of the songs. She just felt like Kurt's um, share should have been a lot higher. So she had input in terms of that, you know, Pat Smear being introduced. I feel like time before that, before Kurt was with Courtney, it was something he probably would have discussed with the other bandmates. I don't feel like it would have just been this thing that happened and except this, this person's here now. But because of her, um, her input and her involvement, I just think that his happiness for it really did take a nosedive and this whole... You know, he she made him buy this car. I can't remember what the car was, but it was a big bougie fucking car and it was unnecessary. And despite the fact that she didn't drive, she wanted him to buy this really expensive car. The following day, he returned it and bought a secondhand car after that. He wasn't, he didn't want the lavish lifestyle. He didn't want to be driving around in limousines. He didn't want to be slaying, staying at the swankiest of hotels. It just wasn't him as a person. And yeah. I just think it got too much and I think he was fed up but in terms of his out I felt like he wanted an out from being so much so heavily in the spotlight with his music and his influence across the world and I think he wanted an out of his marriage I really do I think he fell out of love of what he did with what he did with his music and I honestly feel like he fell out of love with Courtney and I don't know maybe it just became really apparent to him that she really just she was all about the money all about the money. I believe that everything happened as it was supposed to happen in terms of the sequence of, of events from the electrician turning up, from Dylan and Tom Grant's search of the property and finding the note. I think everything happened exactly as it was supposed to. I just don't think that they counted on Tom being as good at his job as he was. I maybe maybe you know speaking to the police officers I know she was friends with one of the detectives like they were really really close I think his name was Sergeant Terry something. Um, and I think she thought it would go the same way for her with Tom as it did with these other people. I'm going to wrap it up and leave it here. I could go on for hours and hours and hours about this. I would really recommend that if you are interested in this and you want to read about everything that I've said and read it for yourself and look into it, I would really recommend the two books that I am going to link in the description. I linked them in the previous video, but I will link them in this one, as well as Tom Grant's website. Like I said, if you want to check out the two books that I'm going to leave in the description below, I highly recommend it. It is mind-blowing reading. I'm getting really irritated at myself because I'm reading Love and Death at the minute. I'm rereading it, but I just keep falling asleep. Like it's taking me forever to get through it, but I really want to get to the end because I just remember it being absolutely fantastic and it's completely no BS. Everything is there, everything's there. They do their own like little timeline like Tom Grant did in his book, but it's interesting to hear it from an outsider's perspective and not just Tom's. If you've got this far, thank you so much for watching. You've no idea how much it means. Um, it's been really cool to talk about a conspiracy that I'm very passionate about. There's just so much surrounding it and it's really heavy and I appreciate that. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. It really helps me out. And to avoid missing out on my future content, you can hit the bell icon and it'll update you with notifications of when I next upload. I upload makeup and conspiracy videos every Tuesday, so to be part of the Conspire fam and to avoid missing out on future content, hit the subscribe button down below. Thank you very much. And yeah, I hope you have a good week. I also wanted to mention, just as a little side note and just like a last part, I'm going to leave down a couple of links of websites to basically help people with their mental health. And if you feel like you need to find somebody to talk to and you feel in a moment in your life where you're really, really lost and sometimes talking to people you know can be hard so I'm going to leave a couple of helpful links down below in the description box don't battle with it on your own you really don't have to like you really don't have to and although I feel like there can be more and more improvements to to help people with mental health I feel like we have come along really far and there are people that are there to listen to you you're never on your own so if you've been I apologize if you've been affected by anything in today's video it's not my intention but like I said there's always someone there to talk to you so I'll leave that all down below 
have a good week and I will see you very soon. Bye.